Hi there, I'm Jason D'Souza. Well, this may be a summer like no other, but we're still finding safe ways to enjoy fresh food, fine music, and even the odd swim. This is our Vancouver. Coming up, step right up to a new eatery inspired by Hawker Markets. And learn how a dip in the pool is looking a little different this year. But first, celebrate BC's bounty of blueberries with a cheesy new recipe that you can try at home. Well, did you know that blueberries are Canada's number one small fruit export and that BC is one of the world's largest high bush blueberry growing regions? Well, now you do. And our province recently declared July 15th BC Blueberry Day. So keep your eyes peeled for some special items at your local restaurants. And we have reached a blueberry aficionado to hear more about his favorites. Dylan Penman is a chef at White Spot. He's been good enough to join us now. Hi, Dylan. Good morning. So happy uh, Blueberry Day, BC Blueberry Day. What do you make of uh, the province's distinction of the day? I love it. It's it's amazing. I mean, uh, some of my fondest memories growing up was uh, going to you picks and just getting buckets and buckets of berries. So I, I love it. And how did the blueberries in our province compare to some of the other ones you'd find around the rest of the world? Well, you know what? We're lucky enough to uh, pretty much only have BC blueberries that I eat here. So uh, based on it being such a massive export and our berries being so good, I'm assuming they must be the best. <laughs> yeah, they must be. I can't argue with that. And I know uh, BC's Blueberry Council has launched a virtual event called Go Blue BC. What can you tell us about that? So it's a really cool online portal that they've set up where there's contests um, and there's different recipes that have been made for home cooks from some chefs throughout the city. Um, so ourselves at White Spot, we, we created uh, a recipe that's featured on, on the portal as well. And there's lots of contests and things. So really cool. It, it runs for the entirety of the month right up until uh, August 3rd. Now, I don't know if I need to disclose the fact that I had a big old bowl of blueberries for breakfast today, and I've got another bowl lined up for after lunch. Uh, but I, like so many others, have them sweet with some Greek yogurt, with some ice cream. I'm wondering, though, from a chef's perspective, how versatile is the fruit? Oh, it, that, it's an amazing product to work. You can really take it in any direction that you like. Um, you can have them for breakfast, you could have them for lunch, you can have them for dinner, as, uh, as you alluded to. Um, but as a chef, we can do so much with them. My personal favorite is to work with them for desserts, but we always feature lots of salads as well, but uh, very versatile. In salads, take us a little through that a bit more. Um, how do you balance the flavor with something like a salad? So we actually put together a salad recipe for the, uh, the campaign, and we actually married it up with a ton of BC produce. Um, we just have such a plethora of ingredients available to us here in BC, which is quite amazing. Um, but we actually did it with a, gr a grilled halloumi cheese. So halloumi cheese is actually uh, a hard cheese, uh, semi-hard, sorry. But um, the cool thing with that is it's used as a meat replacement. And what you can actually do is grill it, say, on the barbecue. And because of the texture of the cheese, it doesn't melt. Um, so what we did in our salad is we marinated in our lemon herb marinade that we use in our restaurants. Um, and then our, our artisan BC greens are tossed with our house vinaigrette. Uh, we top it with some candied pecans, our grilled halloumi, of course, uh, some fresh gala apples, and also some dried BC gala apples, uh, some puffed rice, and then a generous portion of our BC blueberries. So that's actually featured uh, on the Go, Go Blue website. Of course, with halloumi, you're, you're preaching to the choir here, Dylan. It's one of my favorite ingredients, but it makes so much sense because it's, it's that salty, cheesy texture, but you need something to balance it that's sweet, and I, I suppose blueberries do that perfectly. Oh, yeah, it really does. I'm glad you love halloumi as well. It's, it's such a cool ingredient to work with, um, just as kind of an alternative protein people are using it as now, so featuring it in a salad is a really, really cool way for us to go, and you'll see that on our menu one day soon. All right. Uh, a question for you that I have personally, and I know a lot of people wonder it as well. How do you choose a good blueberry? Are you just picking the biggest, the fattest ones you can find, or is there a technique here? Well, speaking from my experience of picking blueberries growing up and, and now as well, I always go for the ones with the deep, 
dark blue color. And the ones that are a little bit larger and more plump, I tend to be a little bit more, more juicy when, when you eat them. But some people will argue that the dark blue smaller ones have better flavor. Just my personal preference is the one that are a little bit bigger. We are, of course, in blueberry season. They're everywhere to be found right now. If you have a blueberry bush in your backyard or you end up with too many to eat, which seems kind of strange because you can never really have too many, how well do they freeze? How well do they store? Oh, honestly, the, the blueberries freeze up so well, they almost uh, IQF themselves when you freeze them, and then you can have them in your, your freezer for the rest of the year to put in your smoothies. What I love them in is, is milkshakes. Um, at White Spot, we have a milkshake on the menu year round with blueberries. It's featured right now at our Triple O's restaurants as well. Um, but that's actually done using the IQF berries. Um, so if anyone wanted to, you know, go out and, and get some blueberries to make their own white spot milkshake at home, to ensure you're getting the best uh, berries, just look for the BC Grown label um, on the packaging and then you'll know you have the best quality berries possible. Okay, so Dylan, I'm going to put you on the spot here. It's a controversial question, I know, but pound for pound, are blueberries BC's top fruit? Oh, I mean, we have such an amazing growing season. And when they're in season, I don't think that anything compares to them. Um, and, you know, we can get them here. We're so lucky. We can get them from the middle of July almost to the middle of September every year. And there's always, like you said, so much available. We can extend the season, dry them, pickle them, freeze them, and just have them available to us all year. So I personally love the blueberries the most. You gave us that excellent halloumi salad recipe. Anything else you're using blueberries for these days? So I alluded to the, the milkshake, right? And every year we have a, a promotion where we run our famous legendary burger with a blueberry pie. So we're offering that blueberry pie again this year. But in case you couldn't decide if you wanted to get the blueberry pie or the blueberry milkshake, We've uh, made the best of bo both worlds and we're featuring a blueberry pie milkshake this year. Uh, so it actually has the pie crust blended up in the shake, and then it actually has a little blueberry tart on top of the whipped cream as well. Uh, it's definitely a must try. There's also an adult version with uh, Grand Marnier and Amaretto added into it, so it kind of plays up that blueberry tea feel. Uh, it, is, it is a treat. Dylan, it's great to see you today. Thank you so much for joining us, and enjoy well, those thank blueberries. You so Thanks so much for having me. Have a great day. Vancouver. Well, it's time for one of our favorite features on the program when we get to showcase some of the photographs sent in by you. Alex Gocher sent us this photo of a marmot overlooking Emerald Lake in Yoho National Park. What a great get that is. And Cheryl Smith captured this photo of a dragonfly at rest in the Okanagan. Finally, Judy Thompson sent us this stunning photo of Steelhead Falls near Hayward Lake in Mission. Thank you so much for that, Judy. And please do send us more. You can email your photos to bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's all one word, bcphotos at cbc.ca. Well, if you appreciated that look at the natural world around us, get ready to take flight. Coming to us from the CBC Creator Network, filmmaker Brent Hodge pays homage to BC's Sea to Sky region in this wordless short film.
if you just want to swim in an outdoor public pool in Vancouver, well, the city has finally opened them for the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic began. As Eva Yuguen Senge reports, even with new pool restrictions, swimmers were eager to get back into the water. Yes, I've been waiting for a long, long time. <laughs> How often are you going to go now that it's open? Mm, like often. It's fantastic. It's the best day in four months. Two of my favorite days of the year, New Year and like the first day of spring. And then I, it's a countdown for the, when the pool opens. Vancouver swimmers have been dying for a dip since May. Because of the pandemic, Vancouver has only just opened the Kitsilano, Second Beach and New Brighton outdoor pools this morning. But cooling off in the water isn't as spontaneous as it was pre-COVID. Swimmers have to book themselves a time slot the day before. Yesterday was the first day of registration. I heard that the, um, the system, the online system, crashed in 45 minutes. Or line up and hope there's a drop-in spot available. For sunbathers, pods have been painted on pool decks for up to two people. Change rooms will be closed for the season, so come prepared wearing your swimsuit. Swimmers also have to bring their own kickboards or other equipment. But the parks board says the water is safe. We also got chlorinated water. So the, the water actually kills bugs, kills the virus, so we're lucky in that respect. The park board says the pools will be cleaned after each 90-minute session, and extra lifeguards are on deck for emergencies. So they would normally do a rescue as they would normally in a pool if they had to go in. Uh, the difference is they wouldn't do a resuscitation in the pool. They would bring the patient or the victim to the side of the pool, and then two other guards would take over, but they would already be ready and kitted up in their PPE to sort of handle that. Outdoor pools have already reopened with similar booking systems in Surrey, Port Moody and Burnaby. Wading pools have also begun to reopen, but with limits on how many swimmers can splash around at the same time. Even all the new rules and restrictions haven't put a damper on pool enthusiasts. It's still really nice. It's a really nice day and I thought I had a really good time. They're just glad that pools are finally open, just as summer weather starts kicking off. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up, Johanna Wagstaff returns with a look at how the European and American space agencies are teaming up to measure Antarctic sea ice. Space agencies from two different countries will be joining forces in the name of climate change research. I love this story because it truly is one of cooperation between national agencies to help try and solve a problem. And that is trying to get an accurate reading of the ice thickness in Antarctica for climate modeling. So the European Space Agency and NASA are teaming their satellites up to get a better look. Authorization was recently just given for Europe's Cryosat 2 spacecraft to raise its orbit by just a few hundred kilometers to line up with NASA's ISAT. Basically, every one and a half days, the two satellites meet over the poles within a few hours of each other, and that means we can observe the same ice at the same time. And this will hopefully lead to the first ever reliable maps of Antarctic sea ice thickness. Currently, most climate models use old climatology gauges to estimate that thickness. In the far south of Antarctica, it's very hard to measure because heavy snow can pile on top of the floating ice, hiding its true thickness. And all that weight can push the Antarctic sea ice under the water. Researchers believe the different instruments on the two satellites working in tandem can help tease apart this complexity. Pretty cool that one satellite is using lasers to measure the height of objects and the other is using radar to penetrate more deeply into the snow. So hopefully this union will bring in the future more accurately uh, estimates of snow cover and therefore more accurate estimates of sea ice thickness. And that means less error in our climate models. And that is information that the whole world can use. And now your science mark. Thanks, Johanna. Welcome back to our Vancouver. I'm Jason D'Souza. And bringing science closer to home, have you ever wondered why there are so many Canada geese across Metro Vancouver? Well, we did, and we spoke to a biodiversity planner to find out more. 
They're hard to miss around Metro Vancouver. Canada geese, gaggles of them, crowding parks, beaches, the seawall, and even the streets. So why are these iconic birds always flocking around our public spaces? <laughs> Urban biodiversity planner Jennifer Ray Pierce says goose populations were actually reintroduced to Metro Vancouver in the 1970s for hunting and consumption. However, unlike their native cousins, these geese don't migrate, and they like our parks and beaches just as much as we do. The main reason is that geese enjoy a lot of the same habitat features that people do. So nice uh, low cut lawns, sloping, uh, gently sloping areas with little ponds are just perfect for geese. There are no exact numbers on the number of geese that live here year round, but Pierce estimates the number could be higher than 2,600. And that amount of geese feeding and living in the city leads to a lot of poop. So Canada geese do produce more poop in volume for the amount of food that they eat than most species do. It's just because their digestive system is not very efficient. And what about all that waste getting into our water? Pierce says not to worry about it. People are always concerned about the impacts of goose species on water quality, and particularly as E. coli numbers are sometimes reported as being at unsafe levels. Um, but actually what's been found is that even in areas where geese are physically relocated, the E. coli numbers don't change in any me real measurable way. So the thinking is that the E. coli source is not primarily geese, but something else. So what is the city doing to keep them under control? So the primary management technique that's used right now in Vancouver is called egg addling. And that's where shortly after the eggs are laid, they're sterilized. The other techniques that work really well is changing the landscape so that it's not as desirable of a place for geese by introducing more shrubbery um, or even temporary fencing around water bodies can help in particular high traffic areas. Some BC cities are also looking at allowing goose hunting permits to tame the population. Because if you didn't know before, the Canada goose is, in fact, edible. He's been a chef at some of the best Pan-Asian restaurants in Metro Vancouver. Now, as he opens the first eatery of his own, he's taking inspiration from the vibrant Hawker Street food markets of Southeast Asia. Justin Chung is the chef and co-owner of Potluck Hawker Eatery, and he's been good enough to join us now. Hi, Justin. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. So first off, Thanks congratulations, for opening day. How are you feeling? Uh, nervous for sure. Uh, nervous and very excited though. I want to get into what opening day and the weekend is all going to feel like. But first off, take us through the timeline. Obviously, these strange days that we're in. What did it take to get to this point in the first place? Uh, a lot of patience. Um, you know, a lot of uh, um, kind of just discovering what kind of relief programs would help fit us. You know, obviously core team building, um, a lot of prep work and, and just a lot of shifting of our, you know, different ways on how we're going to operate. So take us through this. How will Potluck Hawker Eatery work exactly? Uh, well, we're still going to be a counter service style restaurant. Uh, we're going to do takeout and as well, we're going to have some dine-in with uh, limited capacity. I mentioned the inspiration. Can you tell us a little bit more about your own family ties and the inspiration of putting this all together and making it happen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I've been cooking Thai food for the last uh, eight to 10 years and, and um, I've been inspired from my parents. Uh, my mom's from Malaysia and I've always wanted to bring Malaysian food to Vancouver. Have you had a chance to explore Southeast Asia personally and, and see these hawker markets in person? I have. Um, most recently I, I did it trip to Thailand about eight years ago before we opened uh, Longtail um, in the Westminster. And, um, but before that, I haven't been to Malaysia since I was probably 17 years old. I plan to go back before we open, but of course with uh, COVID-19, then you know, that wasn't quite possible. Uh, for the rest of us who haven't had the pleasure of experiencing that firsthand, can you just paint us a picture? It must be amazing. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, just tons of food. Uh, hawker markets just like a, a food court but with a lot of high quality uh, a lot of a lot of selection on very uh, different uh, ethnic dishes and so how will that comparison work for your establishment now 
Yeah, we're going to keep a, a, a tight menu, especially during these times, and we're going to focus on high quality, uh, a good mix of uh, a good balance of stir fries, some bright, uh, fiery salads, and, and um, a lot of snacks. Eventually, we're also going to have um, a liquor license transferred in hopefully a couple weeks. So, we'll also have some import beers as well as some uh, local craft. Of course, I wish we could be talking in person, Justin, and I wish I could be trying the food firsthand. I gotta, I gotta be honest <laughs> with you about that. Uh, yeah. We're not able to do that, of course, because of the times, but can you walk us through some of the flavor profiles, some of your signature dishes that people can expect? Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to be, like I said, very balanced in our flavor, but uh, our food is very bold, very vibrant, um, a lot of spicy, uh, different types of chilies, a lot of funkiness from like fish sauce, shrimp paste, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you'll find a lot of stir fry, a lot of curry, soup noodles. What have you been hearing from the community around excitement? Obviously, on the one hand, with COVID-19 slowing things down, shutting things down, there not being as many options, but just in general to the concept and to the idea. Yeah, the concept, uh, fortunately, it works great for us. That we're, we've always meant to be... Um, uh, sort of a casual eatery. So during this time, our, our food is very takeout friendly. Uh, yeah, just recently seeing the economy start up again, Candy Village has been just amazing. So many people walking around, checking out what the menu is, you know, coming in to say hi and congr congratulating us. So everyone's really looking forward to it. And of course, Justin, for those watching right now, what, what's the message you want to send about these coming weeks and months? Yeah, I, I mean, I think... You know, most summer started a little while ago, but now the weather is really nice. Uh, definitely, you know, take advantage of it. Uh, come in and, and uh, grab some food, take out or eat in. Um, you know, we're going to have a little bit of a lineup some days, but um, we're going to try to accommodate as many people as we can in a, in a safe environment. Well, look, it's great to be able to connect with you today. Best of luck and enjoy. Thank you so much. My name is Brownwin and you're watching our Vancouver. A lot of big events have been cancelled or gone online since the pandemic hit. This week, we want to feature two virtual jazz concerts hosted by the West Vancouver Community Arts Council. The first is by the Chris Brothen Trio featuring West Van's Chris Brothen on drums, Chris Sigerson on piano, and Russ Bodden on acoustic bass. You can see and hear them online on Thursday, July 23rd from 7.30 to 8.30 in the evening. A week later, at the same time, tune in to three of Canada's top jazz talents, pianist Miles Black, bassist Jody Prosnick, and guitarist Bill Kuhn. Together, they are Triology. They'll both be performing live at the Silk Purse Art Centre while everyone is watching online via Zoom. You choose to pay what you want. Well, for more information, you can head to westvanartscouncil.ca. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music, coming to you from home, which is where every Canadian musician is as well. And with tour buses and vans parked and stages dark for the foreseeable future, musicians are finding consistently innovative and inspiring new ways to bring their music to you. Here's the best of Quarantunes for this week. Never meant for
Yes, that is legendary Canadian punk rocker Joey Keithley, lead singer of DOA for the past 42 years. He's also a counselor for the city of Burnaby, BC. Joining him on bass and vocals for that song was Burnaby Mayor Mike Hurley, and that was an original quarantine called We're All In This Together. Now, sticking with Burnaby, Grammy award-winning crooner Michael Bublé also calls that city home and it's where he's riding out the pandemic with his family. And that is where Michael Bublé caught this video on YouTube. Now, Michael Bublé loved that song so much that he decided to record his own version from isolation with a little help from his friends. None other than the Bare Naked Ladies and Mexican pop star Sofia Reyes. Check it out. I just want to see my friends. I want to walk the streets again. So I got to be patient. Let's enjoy this combination. Si tienes ganas de salir, lo siento, pero no. Tienes que quedarte ahí. Pero cuando canto esta canción, ahí me brilla el corazón y me siento muy feliz. Yes, that is one of the best quarantunes yet and truly a global story. That was Canadian superstars Michael Bublé and Bare Naked Ladies along with Mexican pop star Sofia Reyes covering Gotta Be Patient by Stay Home Us, a band from Spain. The proceeds of that song will go to various charities from around the world. Gotta Be Patient is the song that you need to add to your Quarantunes playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. Stay safe, keep Canadian music alive, and I'll check in with you again next week. Be patient. Be so let's enjoy this combination. Well, the need to stay physically distant because of COVID-19 has changed the way many of us see our homes and our work. For these Vancouver artists, it has meant creating a printing press on their patio. They shot this video for CBC Arts. Hi, I'm Sarah Jean Bourget. And I'm Mark Johnson, and we're both visual artists living in Vancouver, BC. As a couple, we've been practicing social distancing since March 15th. The biggest change to our practice was to both lose our studio. Um, for me personally, I had to shift my drawing practice to focus more on printmaking. Mark is a natural printmaker, so for him it was just about scaling down the work. Uh, and then we started collaborating together, using our little uh, press at home. Yeah, we converted our patio into a printmaking studio, which we're calling Patio Press. And we're both super excited about all the future projects that are coming out of it. Over here we have a table for cutting and trimming paper, as well as a slab of granite for mixing and rolling out ink, different tools for cutting and applying pressure and applying ink to print, and a shelving system with different inks to print with, uh, glues, brushes, as well as a beautiful hand-printed sign by our neighbor and printmaker Robin Gleason, and the most important tool of the patio, the press. In terms of the uh, prints we're making, the images we're making, 
uh, they're not necessarily a response to COVID-19, but I think subconsciously we've been making prints that kind of speak to it. Like we've been printing nets, we've been making chains, which, which kind of speak maybe to this idea of being at home, being stuck at home right now. We're very privileged, we're very lucky to be able to have a press at home, uh, to have a community that's caring enough to uh, give us positive reinforcement and willing to participate in a time of isolation. Uh, art is really important right now because it's giving us a direct avenue to the outside world, even when we're all trapped inside. Coming up, a grad student originally from Vancouver helped get a South Asian matchmaking site to drop its skin tone filter. Welcome back to our Vancouver, I'm Jason D'Souza. Well, a popular South Asian matchmaking site used all over the world has removed a skin tone filter from its search options, thanks in part to the lobbying of a student originally from Vancouver. Megan Nugpal was part of a group that pushed Shadi.com to remove the filter, which they called discriminatory and offensive. As far as Morelli tells us, it's a filter that ties into historic views amongst the South Asian community that light skin is more beautiful. Baby. It's an app that advertises itself as a place to meet someone for keeps. Shadi literally means marriage in Hindi. Megan Nagpal used to have an account until she kept coming across something troubling, a skin tone filter. It has you select whether you are uh, light-skinned, fair, uh, what they call uh, weedish, would be somewhere between light and dark or dark. And users can filter out uh, the skin tone based on their preference of what um, skin tone they want. So Nagpal mobilized. She started tweeting at Shadi.com and joined a group that launched this petition to remove the skin tone filter. The company listened. She was able to get the petition directly to the executives of the website and overnight the filter was gone. You know you've become really beautiful. Your face is fair and glowing. For decades, skin lightening creams like Fair and Lovely have been a massive industry in places like India because lighter skin is historically seen as more desirable. That bias is called shadism, also known as colorism, prevalent in the South Asian community. The root of it is slavery. The root of it is also colonization. When a group has been historically oppressed and they have not been given the freedom to understand what their own identity is, uh, something like colorism is very easy to fester in communities because we don't know what makes us enough. Many are now pushing to change perceptions. Marusha Yogaraja was part of a photography project called Unfair and Lovely. It's now a social media movement trying to undo the antiquated notion that light equals beautiful. I do believe that there is some form of empowerment that's happening with darker skinned girls. Um, I don't necessarily know if that's happening with folks who are elders. I have a really hard time having these conversations in, because it's so deeply embedded in anti-blackness. While there's plenty of work to do, momentum is building. Though still a lightning cream, Fair and Lovely recently rebranded to Glow and Lovely. And Nagpal says two other South Asian dating sites have also agreed to remove similar filters. If change is happening in the States um, in regards to equality between black people and white people, I would hope that in the South Asian culture, change would also be facilitated as a result of this movement. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. 
Coming up, before you adopt a rescue dog, make sure you know what you're getting. We'll hear from two new owners who paid a lot more for their first vet bill. You're watching our Vancouver, I'm Jason D'Souza. Well, a BC-based dog rescue operation is under fire from some of its former customers. They say they believe they were adopting dogs from kill shelters in California, only to end up with sick dogs from the streets of Mexico. Eric Rankin from our CBC Vancouver Impact team has this exclusive story. You wouldn't know it from looking at Kihei, but her original price was $1,100. In fact, she ended up costing Ashley Kipping almost $5,000 because the rescue dog had to be rescued from a disease it carried. It just makes me want to cry still. Kipping adopted from Fur Baby Rescues, a dog rescue in Chilliwack. On its Facebook page, it promises healthy dogs from Southern California kill shelters, brought to BC and adopted out to loving homes. But Kihei started bleeding through her skin. Kipping's vet discovered the pup had a serious tick-borne illness, endemic to Mexico, and the dog's vaccination records were in Spanish. In reality, she was actually from the streets of Tijuana. CBC News talked to eight former customers with ailing dogs from Fur Baby Rescues, including Lori Carlson, who adopted Lily. Her dog developed a mystery illness. I was fine with paying my vet bills, but not for a fully vetted dog that wasn't. Carlson says she spent $1,600 to save Lily. Kipping shelled out $3,900 in vet bills. And when she withheld payment of the $1,100 she owed Fur Baby Rescues for Kihei, Owner Crystal Jores publicly posted Kipping's private client information on Facebook, including Kipping's passport, address, and phone number. Online, Jores has denounced detractors as haters and 50-year-old hags. She declined an interview, stating, Fur Baby Rescues does not respond to rumors and drama, and cited 800 happy adopters. It is Monday morning, April 27th. There are no quarantine requirements for imported dogs, just proof of a rabies vaccination. But in April, Jores failed to do that, only allowed into Canada after an overnight visit to a Bellingham vet. We got 19 rescue dogs across the border with zero issues. It is the Wild West. Kathy Powelson is an animal welfare advocate, calling for better regulation of an unregulated industry. There is no standards that organizations must meet in order to do this work. The vet who diagnosed Kihei's Mexican illness worries sick rescue dogs could infect BC pets. I do believe that it could pose one day a significant risk for our dogs that live here in Canada. Ashley Kipping has some simple advice. I guess all in all I'd just say do your homework. Eric Rankin, CBC News, Vancouver. All right, it's time now to rewind the clock back with the help of our CBC archives. From your phone, from your watch, from the bus, GPS is everywhere these days, tracking people and things around the world. 25 years ago, though, when a BC cab company tested putting GPS in their cars, some drivers didn't like it. Here's Ian Hannah Mansing with that story. From the outside, it hardly looks high tech. Go right away, sir. But this cab company is home to some sophisticated computer and satellite technology. Will you be waiting out front, ma'am? For years now, some taxi companies have used data terminals like this one to keep in touch with drivers. What's leading edge about the system at Bel Air Taxi is that it's hooked into a web of satellites called GPS. GPS is the Global Positioning System, a network of 24 satellites set up by the U.S. military for navigation. It's now used by civilians like boaters and even hikers. A small receiver reads the satellite signals, figures out where the user is, and can even track the direction and speed they're going. The taxi system takes that one step further, transmitting to the main computer every few seconds exactly where the cab is. The dispatcher simply checks the screen to find out a cab's location and its status. For example, car 74 is purple when it's on its way to pick up a fare and turns light blue when the meter is turned on. 
gives us the ability to uh, track the cars wherever they are. I'm told it's within approximately 100 feet of the actual vehicle location. Addresses can be typed into the computer and the dispatcher can give a lost driver directions. In an emergency, a red dot appears and police know exactly where to go. Oh, there's a cheater. But the most practical application is finding cheaters, drivers who fib to the dispatchers about where they are. Way off. He's uh, around Metro Town. He's telling the computer he's just at the top of the hill here in Coquitlam. A classic example of cheating is when a driver drops a fare off at the airport and then tells the computer he's actually downtown. What he hopes is by the time he gets here, he'll be at the top of the list. But sometimes the call comes while he's still 15 or 20 minutes away, leaving a customer fuming. But with GPS, a cheater can quickly be found out. And so not surprisingly, drivers are a little ambivalent about this new system. We make more money by cheating <laughs> as we make now. But customer got good service if we don't cheat. The company that developed the Bel Air taxi system predicts that within a few years, virtually every car will have something similar. So you might know as you're driving down on Highway 99 where your wife is, where your dad is, where your son is. I mean, you could see them on the map. And I mean, if they're close enough, you know, you may want to send them a message saying, hey, maybe we can have coffee together. I mean, that is not far-fetched. The main obstacle now is money. For big taxi companies, this system could cost tens of thousands of dollars. But manufacturers say one day GPS will be no more exotic or expensive than a car stereo. Ian Hanamancing, CBC News, Coquitlam, British Columbia. CBC Vancouver is lucky to have an award-winning photographer on staff. Ben Nelms captures all sorts of images of life in our city. Here are some of his best of the week. That is all our Vancouver for this week. I'm Jason D'Souza. Thanks for watching.